Super. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar on fisheries subsidies and what is the state of play and where to next. And of course, it's a webinar that focuses very much on the WTO's negotiations on a new agreement on fisheries subsidies. Uh, for those of you who I haven't yet met, my name's Alice Tipping, and I lead work on fisheries subsidies at the International Institute for Sustainable Development based in Geneva. Um, and what we're going to do in the next hour or so is a couple of different things. We're going to start with a relatively quick, a relatively succinct run through of the state of play in the negotiations, basing ourselves on the chair's text, the text that the chair of the negotiations essentially put to ministers uh, for what was going to be the WTO's ministerial conference in December, which was unfortunately postponed. But that is essentially the state of play in the negotiations. It's the text that reflects uh, where there is convergence, uh, where there is still divergence, and it identifies for us uh, where some of the key gaps still are. And then we have the benefit of hearing from two experts who have been following uh, this negotiation very closely, so I know, very much know what they're talking about. Um, the first is Sebastian Matthew, who is the Executive Director of the International Collective in Support of Fish Workers based in India. So thank you uh, and good evening, Sebastian. Thanks for joining us at the end of your work day. Um, and then we're going to hear from Ernesto, uh, sorry, Ernesto Fernandez Monke, who's an officer at the Pew Charitable Trust uh, based in Washington. So good morning to Washington and good evening to India and good afternoon to everyone else. Um, so I've asked Ernesto and Matthew to come along and give us just brief, uh, sort of some, some brief views from their different perspectives on what some key issues are in the text for them and some ideas for you as negotiators uh, about how you might think of closing some of the remaining gaps and from their perspective, where to next on some of these key issues. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be relatively swift in the first part. I have a watch here and I'm going to time myself to make sure I don't take too long. Uh, so we'll start now with the, the presentation of the text as it is. Two big caveats, of course, uh, this presentation reflects our IISD's reading of the chair's text of 24 November 2001. Um, that's the document reference number there for you. Other readings are possible. This is our best interpretation um, based on a careful reading of the text and a careful reading of the chair's uh, explanatory note of what the provisions are designed to do. There are other ideas and proposals out there the, if they're not captured in the chair's text, we won't address them formally here, except for giving Ernesto and Sebastian uh, the floor to give you some ideas. So second big caveat, of course, as with every WTO negotiation, nothing is agreed yet. Uh, all of the text technically is still in square brackets. No one has signed it. Uh, some areas do appear to be more stabilized. There are some whole articles with very, very few brackets in them. Um, and But of course, there are some areas of clear disagreement that remain in the text. Uh, and most of those, I think, are still bracketed. So, uh, you know, if, even if my language tends to, to be kind of, here is what the provision says, um, bear in mind that none of it's agreed yet. So with that important caveat, um, I'm going to start with uh, the question of scope and questions of definitions. Um, these are important because they really help to frame all of the other obligations, of course. Uh, many of you experienced negotiators will know this backwards, uh, but it's important framing, I think, as we think about everything else. Basic approach, this new agreement applies in principle to specific subsidies provided to fishing and fishing related activities when those take place at sea. So we're not covering subsidies to aquaculture, inland fishing, onshore activities like fish processing when it happens onshore. Um, First important point, an important point of divergence we get to immediately. Uh, you'll, many of you, I think, be very familiar with the text in square brackets in paragraph 1.2. And this is the idea that non-specific fuel subsidies would be included in the scope of the agreement. It's a contentious point, right? Some members argue that from an environmental perspective, it doesn't matter whether a subsidy to fuel is specific or not, it can still have an environmental impact uh, and so should be within the purview of the agreement. Um, others say, well, we never, you know, we didn't, uh, or at least we didn't apply disciplines onto um, non-specific subsidies in the SCM. If we do it here, it might be confusing. So still a point of contention there. One important change to be aware of, at least that we noticed in the 24 November version of the text, um, is in the definition of who is an operator of a fishing vessel. Uh, and here the text removes the requirement that that operator be on board the vessel. And so this widens the concept, we think, to include companies that might operate one or several vessels. 
Um, and so essentially it, move, it means that you can include companies. It doesn't have to be the specific person operating the actual vessel. And this becomes important when we get to the first substantive discipline, which is the idea of prohibiting subsidies to illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, Article 3. Um, so again, the basic idea here, uh, many of you will be familiar with, is the idea that members must not provide subsidies to fishing vessels or operators if a coastal state or a flag state or a relevant RFMO makes an affirmative determination that that vessel or operator has engaged in IUU fishing. And the first sort of important change or development to note, I think, um, is right in, in Article 3.1. And this is the language uh, that's been added around the fact that the prohibition would also apply to subsidies to fishing related activities in support of IUU fishing. Now I've put the word such there in round brackets. It's not in the text, that's my own addition, but I put it there because reading the chair's note, it seems there's been some discussion about whether we should include that word. And I think the fact that there's a discussion around that gives us a sense of what negotiators understand it to mean. I stand to be corrected. If I'm wrong, please raise your hand and tell me at the end. Um, so I, at least as we understand it, the idea is that if, if a fishing vessel is the subject of an IUU determination, subsidies are prohibited to that vessel, but subsidies are also prohibited to fishing related activities. So vessels that might be transshipping from the IUU vessel or vessels that might be fueling or servicing that IUU vessel. So this widens the scope of the prohibition, okay? But in real life, the difference is really going to be in fisheries where you have not just vessels fishing, but vessels supporting kind of a broader operation. So that's one important sort of change to note, I think. Um, as a reminder, Article 3.2 lists the entities that can make an IUU determination. Uh, and just a reminder that it's, we're talking here about an affirmative determination. Now that word's been added to make it very clear that once you have a determination that there has been IU fishing, that's what counts for the purposes of this agreement. So no other entity can nullify that determination. So that's the basic kind of the strict elements of the, of the two of the prohibition, 3.1 and 3.2. Um, we will get then to um, the important point, and I'll come back to the SNDT element here too. Um, but what I think is really important here is that we have, after a lot of very long hard work and very long nights and weekends, um, we have a potential compromise, a proposed compromise for the key elements of Article 3 that strike a delicate balance between the strict prohibition, which was on the last slide, and the different levels of control that the coastal state might have over triggering the prohibition and the control that the subsidizing member has over how that prohibition is applied. So let's look at that balance between the triggering and the application. So Article 3.3, this is where a lot of very hard work has been done and it's drafted very, very carefully. So Article 3 now sets out essentially three procedural steps uh, that a determination needs to fulfill in order for it to trigger a subsidy obligation under this agreement. The first is a notification of the flag state or a subsidizing member, if it's known, at the beginning of the IUU determination process, whether that's because a vessel's been detained or because an investigation has been initiated, depends a bit on your process. But that notification should also contain information the flag state or subsidizer needs to know, the relevant factual information. You know, it is this vessel, for example, that was found doing this activity in this area. That's the sort of information, at least in my head, that would that would qualify. And the notification should include the relevant rules and procedures that apply. So the flag state or the subsidizing member knows what the problem is. The second step is that the, de the determination process needs to include an opportunity to exchange relevant information that the coastal state can then take into account when it makes its final determination. It gives the flag state or the subsidizing member more access to the determination process a chance to actually explain its point of view, but the coastal state keeps control of the timetable, right? It can specify when and how information, including the dialogue, is conducted. And there's an important new phrase, I think, in Article 3.3, and it's this one about relevant factual information. What has to be provided uh, in, uh, in the determination, and what does the determination have to be based on? And this particular choice of language, I think, is meant to mean that there has to be some accurate information provided to make it clear what the vessel or operator is supposed to have done wrong. But 
other WTO members and the WTO dispute panel, if it ever got that far, don't have the ability then to question whether that information is in fact sufficient evidence that the vessel did something wrong. That judgment, that substantive judgment about whether there was an offence under domestic law is for the determining entity to make. So that's an important choice of language there and a very delicate one again. So the last requirement is that the affirmative determination has to be notified to the flag state and the subsidizing member along with the sanctions and their duration. It's essentially the information the subsidizer needs to know to then consider how long it should withhold subsidies for. And that's the other side of the balance, right? So if the determination follow those procedural steps, then the subsidy obligation, the subsidy prohibition is triggered. Then what happens? The subsidizing member, and here's the other the part of the balance, the careful balance, subsidizing members can decide how long the prohibition lasts for, depending on the nature, gravity, repetition of the infraction. But they can't, they don't have complete discretion as to how long the prohibition lasts, right? The prohibition of subsidies to that vessel or operator has to remain, has to be at least as long as the sanction or the vessel listing remains in place. Um, so on both sides, you need notification of the determinations to the WTO and the notification of how the sanction, or sorry, how the subsidy prohibition was applied. Um, I focus very much here on 3.3, which focuses on what coastal state determinations have to do. But just to note one other interesting point in article uh, in the latest draft is that RFMO determination procedures must also include notification of flag states and the provision of relevant information if they're going to trigger the subsidy prohibition. And speaking of information, there's one substantive obligation here that I haven't covered because it hasn't been a big point of contention, but just a flag, if a port state provides a member with information that a vessel in its port may have engaged in IUU, and this is what port states are obliged to do if they're parties to the port state measures agreement, the subsidizing member has to give due regard to this information and take the actions it deems appropriate. So a much softer trigger, not an obligation to withdraw subsidies, but an obligation to consider this information. Key footnotes to remember, and these are probably imprinted on everyone's brains already, um, the terminations have to follow procedural steps, but there are no grounds for questioning the substantive decisions made, right, or domestic legal proceedings. There's also nothing in this agreement that obliges you to make an IU determination. That's entirely for the coastal state. You'll have seen the point there about uh, bracketed language around special and differential treatment. We'll see this also in Article 4. The idea is that uh, small scale, well, to use the exact words, re resource poor uh, and livelihood fishing activities within 12 nautical miles, if those are subject to an IUU determination, the subsidy obligation applies, but it cannot be challenged for two years or a number of years still in brackets. And that's called a grace period under WTO law. So the WTO, so the ob obligation applies, but for developing countries, for IUU determinations in that circumstance, there's a grace period. Okay, now Article 4. So Article 3, well done negotiators. It looks like there's a really carefully drafted balance already there. Article 4 looks at subsidies to overfished stocks. And this one's quite a lot simpler. You'll be relieved to hear. So the debate here for years revolved around who decides when a stock is overfished and what happens once there's that decision. And it seems to be now convergence over what the balance should be. So the basic rule is uh, subsidies for fishing of overfished stocks is prohibited. And who decides? Well, national authorities and RFMOs, but they don't have complete discretion. They have to base themselves on the best scientific evidence available to them. Okay, that's the relatively strict prohibition. But on the other side, there are now in the text, uh, with brackets removed, two, one smaller and one larger exemption. The smaller one is an exemption for subsidies that are specifically implemented to rebuild the overfished stock. And there's also a wider exemption that would allow other subsidies to be provided as well if measures are implemented to rebuild the stock. So there's two elements there that I think sort of, you know, reduce the, reduce the impact and reduce the immediacy of what is otherwise quite a strict prohibition. Um, important point here, and this is what the grace period for both the overfished stocks and the IUU article look like, if these subsidies are provided to low-income resource, poor livelihood fishing within 
potentially 12 nautical miles, but to be defined, if that fishing happens on an overfished stock, um, in developing countries, developing countries may still provide those subsidies. They don't have to comply with the other two exemptions, but uh, those subsidies cannot be challenged in the WTO system for a period of years. Again, a grace period rather than a complete exemption. So those are two SNDT elements to be aware of. And this takes us to Article 5, um, which is probably the the biggest, uh, the areas of biggest divergence still, um, and perhaps where thinking about the next steps is probably the most useful. So the draft of 24 November doesn't actually change a lot from the previous early November draft, but there are still key areas of debate in place, right? And I've highlighted, well, I've highlighted one here. And the first one, I think in particular, uh, in the context of the basic prohibition and its qualifier, which is what you see here, is the movement of what was previously a separate rule on subsidies contingent on fishing in areas outside your EZ. That used to be a separate rule outside the main prohibition, and it was moved into the main prohibition in the November drafts. And this move essentially has two main implications. It means that the rule is now, that rule is now subject to the qualifier in Article 511, that's on the right hand side. And so that essentially means that members can still provide subsidies contingent on fishing outside their EEZs if measures are in place to keep the stocks fished at a, re at a sustainable level. But it also means that this rule is now subject to the SNDT exceptions um, in what is now Article 5.4 and Article 6. So that's an important point to, to think about in the, in the balance of things. Um, important point to note there on the footnote that helps you understand who decides what the biologically sustainable level is? Answer, it's the coastal member or the relevant RFMO. Um, and the idea that that, in, that decision should be based on reference points, but that those can be chosen commensurate with the data available for the fishery. So sort of an objective standard about what it should look like, um, but flexibility about how it's decided. And here we get to one of the most interesting parts, and that we'll come to also later, uh, the question on special and differential treatment in Article 5. So in Article 5, the SNDT only applies to the main prohibition, 5.1. So I tend to think about them together before moving on to the other parts of Article 5. There are three main exemptions at the moment um, from Article 5.1.1, essentially exemptions from showing or exemptions that mean you can provide subsidies listed without having to show the management requirements. The first is a transition period for subsidies to non-artisanal or commercial scale fishing within EZs and RFMO areas. So developing countries could provide these subsidies without having to show five on one for a period of time. And the key element is of course, how long that might be. And we've had proposals between five and 25 years. The answer may lie somewhere in the middle. There's also currently a permanent exemption for subsidies to I think what's commonly considered artisanal fishing, low income resource, poor livelihood fishing uh, within a 12 nautical mile limit of the coast. And that's still in brackets, the number 12, because there's still debate around whether 12 nautical miles is an appropriate limit. So that's a permanent exemption. Um, those subsidies could be provided without having recourse to 511. Last, there is at the moment also a permanent exemption from 51 and 511 for all subsidies provided by de minimis members, essentially those that contribute less than a certain percentage of marine capture. The, chair, sorry, the text currently suggests the limit would be at 0.7% of global catch, but there's very different views about whether this is the right level for this kind of exemption, we should, whether we should have it too. But the last important point, particularly from a sustainable development perspective, is that in the article there's now a sort of soft responsibility requirement attached uh, to the use of these exceptions. Right? So members that are using 5.4 uh, should also endeavour to ensure and otherwise do their best to keep subsidies from contributing to overcapacity and overfishing. Last very important political element to note here is that there's a new footnote in the text, footnote 12, which essentially would exclude any member responsible for more than 10% of global catch from using this provision, from using 5.4, all three elements of it. Now, by our calculations, the only developing country member with a catch greater than 10% is currently China at about 15%. So the questions essentially, I think, are the things involved. Do, do these, do, what could the limits be? 
um, and more broadly, all of Article 5.4 is still in brackets um, to leave space for debate about whether this is the right construction. So, um, two additional prohibitions in Article 5, not subject to SNDT, they apply to all members, so maybe deal with them separately, it's what we're going to do here. The first is a prohibition of all subsidies to fishing in the high seas that's outside the competence of an RFMO. Uh, and secondly, the idea of prohibiting subsidies to vessels that don't fly the flag of the subsidizing member. And there's two alternatives still in the text here. Views of members are still quite far apart. A relatively strict, simple prohibition. Uh, members can't subsidize vessels that don't fly their flag, full stop. Or another alternative that focuses more on whether the flag state or the subsidizing member rather has either jurisdiction or control or some other way of ensuring the vessels aren't contributing to overcapacity or overfishing. So a much broader concept of the idea. So those are the two additional prohibitions in five. Um, I'm going to move relatively quickly through the LDCs and the technical assistance capacity building elements to get to notifications, which are important. Um, three specific ideas of exemptions for LDCs, a full permanent exemption from Article 511. Uh, LDCs would need to notify and use best endeavours to ensure the subsidies weren't contributing to overcapacity and overfishing, but a full permanent exemption from 51. The second, the idea that this exemption would apply for countries that were LDCs but recently graduated. So for a period of six years to be determined, they could still benefit from the exemption in 6.1. Um, and last, the idea that other members should exercise due restraint in raising matters with LDCs, taking account of their particular development situation. So those are the three elements for LDCs. Technical assistance and capacity building, two elements also still bracketed. The first, very basic, there should be technical assistance and capacity building provided to developing country members, and the idea of some kind of voluntary funding mechanism to be established to support this technical assistance. Um, and that's an ongoing debate around what that fund should look like, what could it do, what should it not do. So there's an ongoing uh, discussion going on there. Article 8. Um, now, I've actually left out of this presentation Article 9 on institutional arrangements uh, because I think it is at last clear that this agreement will be a standalone agreement, uh, not an annex to the ACM. So the establishment of a committee should be relatively straightforward. Now, Article 8. Articles on notification uh, and transparency can sometimes feel a bit boring, but these ones are really important because there are some elements you have to comply with if you want to use the exemptions or the exceptions in the agreement. So all members already, all WTO members already have to notify basic economic information about their fishery subsidies, the amount, the names of the program, et cetera. Under this agreement, they would also have to notify some additional fisheries related information. And this is set out in Article 8.1a. So the first two things, here they are, um, members would have to notify the type of fishing activity subsidized and the catch data for the species. Sorry, the catch data for the species in the subsidized fishery. Now, two footnotes to note specifically here. Footnote 15 suggests that LDCs and de minimis members, members with a de minimis level of catch, could provide this information every four years to reduce the burden on them. And the second idea in footnote 16, there is some flexibility built in here for multi-species fisheries, right? Members wouldn't necessarily have catch per species in a multi-species fishery, so they could provide other relevant and available catch data. And here's the important link, and now it's in what's called up here, now it's Article 8.6. Uh, the numbers keep changing for a draft, so it's now 8.6. You have to have notified these two bits of information if you want to use the exemptions in sub in the, for subsidies to overfished stocks, uh, the general management qualifier and the general prohibition, or the SNDT prohibition, or the SNDT exemptions, rather. Essentially, because this allows other members to understand the scale of the fishing activity you're continuing to subsidize. The second important point um, under Article 8.1b is that members should, to the extent possible, notify some other more detailed information, the status of the stocks they're subsidizing, the conservation measures in place. So importantly here from 8.6, if a member wants to use any of the exemptions that rely on fisheries management, like 4.3, you have measures in place, 5.1.1, you have measures in place, you have to have notified these measures under 8.1b, and you have to have notified the status of the stock. And this is meant to help other members to see whether the exemptions are being used responsibly, um, whether in fact the stock is recovering, for example. 
so fleet capacity, the idea of subsidized vessels should be notified wherever possible, but that notification isn't required to access any of the exemptions. Okay, important addition here in the transparency section is what the text calls 8.1 BIS. The idea that members would be obliged to notify non-specific fuel subsidies they provide or which their vessels use. And this is an idea that could serve a couple of different functions depending on, I think, where the negotiations go. If non-specific fuel subsidies are included in this agreement, the provision would act as a corresponding sort of transparency obligation to ensure the extent of the subsidi of that subsidization was covered. But if non-specific fuel subsidies aren't included, this could be a way nonetheless of ensuring members have to be transparent about what they're providing in terms of horizontal fuel subsidies that benefit fishing in case those subsidies have an impact on fishing activity. There are several ongoing notification obligations. Members must notify their IUU determinations. Uh, members must notify the fisheries access agreements um, that they've entered into. Um, basically title list of parties and to the extent possible, the full agreement. Important addition here, still in brackets, but members would also be obliged to notify the committee of information about vessels that suggested the vessels were using forced labor. This is an important political issue for many members, some very, very firmly uh, in favor, some very firmly still opposed. And lastly, there's a set of things that members should notify. Where is it there? Um, a set of things members should notify at entry into force, and then if there are any modifications, the measures you've taken to implement the agreement, the description of your fisheries management regime, and any RFMOs that you're party to, right? And this is an, interest, an interesting point because essentially it means that if other members not party to that RFMO are going to respect decisions made by it, even if they're not subject to those decisions, it should be clear how those bodies operate. So that's the notification and transparency in summary. Um, I'm going to jump to the final provisions here because the dispute settlement article seems to be pretty much stabilized. The WTO's dispute settlement understanding as it's applied to the ACM applies here too. Non-violation claims are excluded, um, which is a real issue for <laughs> deep WTO lawyers, um, which we can get to in the discussion if, if anyone's really interested. Okay, final provisions. Now, these are also important because they address a couple of general rules, and they also talk about how this agreement works sort of vis-a-vis -vis the broader corpus of international law. First two general sort of horizontal rules, members must exercise special care when subsidizing fishing about assessed stocks. And a further provision, almost more of an exception to Article 5 that ended up here, that it allows members to provide subsidies for disaster relief as long as those subsidies are limited to the particular disaster and to uh, return the fishery to its pre-disaster level. And then we come to a number of savings provisions. Crucial, very politically sensitive provision here, Article 11.3 on territoriality. The question of how WTO dispute panels should address, if at all, questions of disputed jurisdiction over different parts of the water. Two ideas, essentially, a sort of savings provision, nothing under this instrument or any panel finding the recommendations have any implications for disputed maritime boundaries. And secondly, the question of a sort of a jurisdictional limit that members are still trying to work through. How to instruct WTO panels to consider or not consider or to what extent they should consider claims in disputes where a WTO member, a party, maybe also a third party, claims that there is a territorial issue uh, at is or the territorial dispute at issue in the claim. Um, and very lastly, three sort of savings provisions, preserving members' rights and obligations under international law, including under the existing ASCM. That has been an extremely quick run through of what is a very complicated text. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, before I turn over to our, our, our next two crucial stakeholders, if you would like to talk through the text with a little bit more time, which I would understand, um, please do get in touch because this is what our job is. This is what we're paid to do is to help members understand and think through what the text implies and to help them think through some of the options for removing those last few brackets. So you'll get all of these slides anyway, um, but there are our email addresses if you'd like to reach out. So that with no small amount of relief on your side, I think, uh, is it from me. Um, so uh, Sebastian, you've been extremely patient. You two have an escort as well. And Sebastian, you've been following these negotiations for 
many, many years. You, we, you've been working, we've been working together for at least a decade. Um, but tell us, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I know you have some things to share, but tell us what you think of some of the remaining gaps. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Alice, for inviting us to uh, participate in this, uh, in this discussion. So uh, can I share my screen, please? Yeah. yeah. Yes, you should be able to now. Go ahead. Okay. That's perfect. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's visible. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, draw the attention of uh, all the uh, participants of this important meeting uh, to the recent uh, statistics from FAO, uh, which shows that uh, world capture fisheries uh, in marine waters now has uh, fallen to 80.4 million tons from 85 million tons in 2018. So uh, there's already a reduction of 5 million tons. And then uh, if you look at the top seven fishing countries, uh, five are from developing countries. It's very important to notice that. So these include China, Indonesia, India, uh, Peru, and Vietnam. Uh, and then if you look at uh, the share of uh, developing countries uh, in exports, uh, uh, total fishery exports, you can see that uh, in value terms, they contribute 54%, and in quantity terms, they uh, contribute over 60%. So it's important to keep these uh, statistics in mind. And then uh, we should also keep in mind the fact that uh, global marine uh, fish production uh, peaked in 1996. So, so therefore, that was 96.4. So from, where, from there, now it has uh, come down to 80.4 uh, 80 million tons. Um, Next page, uh, yeah. So, uh, so I have uh, some comments on uh, on the uh, low income, uh, resource poor, and livelihood fishing. So, uh, my suggestion is that uh, 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 instead of using a, a broad uh, brush uh, definition of low income, resource poor, and livelihood fishing, uh, we should uh, try to uh, see that you know the, the, these are kind of confined uh, only to uh, known toad uh, fishing gear and practices, uh, especially in association with uh, fishing vessels, less than 12 meters in length. Because if you look at the FAO statistics, uh, it shows that uh, over 40% of the global fishing fleet are vessels below 12 meters. So therefore, these vessels can be uh, in uh, proxy for uh, low income resource poor livelihood fishing. And, uh, and when you talk about uh, low income resource poor livelihood fishing, uh, it should also exclude uh, destructive uh, uh, bottom trawlers in particular, regardless of size. So therefore, all bottom trawlers uh, should be uh, excluded from the scope of uh, low income resource poor and livelihood fishing. And then uh, we have to also bear in mind that uh, this type of fishing is not only confined to the internal waters and the territorial waters, but you also find them in the EEZ, especially if you talk about uh, highly migratory fish stocks like tuna stocks. So they are present in the EEZ and therefore, the peace clause uh, under uh, Articles 3.8, 4.4, uh, and 5.4b2 uh, uh, should apply to uh, the EEZ as well. So therefore, the uh, low-income resource poor livelihood fishing uh, within that uh, uh, narrow brush uh, definition should uh, extend from the internal waters to the EEZ. And then uh, we would like to also uh, 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 take the position that uh, you know there is no blank check for any category of, uh, of fishing. So therefore, after a transition period, that should be uh, negotiated. Uh, I think all types of fishing, including low income, resource poor and livelihood fishing, they need to adopt uh, measures towards conservation and sustainable use of the living marine resources. So that's very important to think in terms of everyone uh, 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 following the same rules in, in course of time. And then uh, uh, when it comes to the, the draft uh, text agreement on, uh, on fishery subsidies that uh, Alice presented uh, just before me, uh, we also uh, we are, we are of the opinion that you know, this uh, text is uh, fairly balanced. So we support this text. And then uh, we feel that uh, given the nature of uh, the overexploitation and the uh, role of both developed and developing and recent in resource exploitation, uh, we need to adopt a universal approach on uh, to fishery subsidies and 
especially to promote uh, conservation and sustainable use of living marine resources. Therefore, the sustainability mandate of WTO is what we would like to uh, highlight in these negotiations. And then uh, very important to keep in mind that the sovereign rights of the coastal states to explore and exploit living marine resources has to be matched with the uh, sovereign rights to conserve and manage uh, these resources for present and future generations. Because you can see there is, there is a kind of a asymmetry between exploration and exploitation uh, on the one side and the conservation and management on the other side. So we feel that this asymmetry needs to be addressed. And then uh, uh, I just would like to draw attention to uh, 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 Mr. Chu dong -Kyu, the FAO Director General. Uh, he wrote in the SOFIA 2020 forward that uh, there are worrying signs of overfishing and uh, it's high time to reverse the global trend of overfish stocks. So I think it's very important uh, to keep this message in mind and to work towards uh, uh, kind of shifting gear from, uh, from exploitation to conservation and management. Yeah. Thank you. That's a brief message to all of you. No, super. Thank you very much indeed, Sebastian. That's extremely helpful, um, right? And I think I think that's very useful. We will be sharing Sebastian's slides along with mine, everyone. Um, so you'll have those messages to come back to. But I think there's some very interesting ideas there when we're thinking about how to, you know, how to look back at Article Five and the balance that it strikes, and to think from a long-term perspective, because this treaty is going to govern fishery subsidies for at least the next twenty years. Um, you know, what 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 sort of forward looking situations do we want to encourage governments to move into? So that's some really useful insight, I think, from somebody who works with small scale fishers all the time. OK, thanks, Sebastian. That's brilliant. And this thought, I might turn to you now. Um, Pew's been following these negotiations very closely, so I'd be keen to hear your views, too. Go ahead. Thank you, Alice. Um, and I, I would like to, can I share now? I think so, Sebastian, we may have to ask yeah. you to stop sharing. Yeah, and then Ernesto can put his up. Thanks. Let me see if we can do this. Yeah. Super. All yours, Ernesto. Okay, let me know if it's working now. Go for it. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you, Alice. And I would like to thank uh, ISD for, for the opportunity to, to give the perspective of the envir environmental NGO community uh, on, the, on the latest text on the, on the state of play. Um, as some of you may know, a group of um, NGOs co-sponsor a, a textual analysis um, of the Cheris text back in November. Of last year, last year before the current text was circulated to ministers, uh, in this textual analysis, we have made recommendations that that we hope will will contribute to your efforts to to try to find a convergence and finalize the the what now is an overdue agreement in our view. Um, with we think the solutions are within within reach, and and um, the cost of of inaction is too is too high. Um, I take the opportunity to, to announce that we will uh, be finalizing the, the new version of this analysis uh, based on the text distributed on November, November 24, and we'll be circulating uh, it to, to, to members in the coming, in the coming days. Um, from the conservation perspective, um, there are many good provisions in, in, the, in the latest uh, text. Uh, we believe that there are enough elements uh, and, and the approaches that are in the different pillars of pro provisions that uh, we have seen from, from the very good uh, presentation from Alice <laughs> in the run through uh, of, the, of what is in the text. Um, I think we, we go in the direction of, of trying to address the, and deliver on the Sustainable Development Goal 14.6 mandate. Um, and here I would like to stress the, or emphasize the fact that uh, members are negotiating not only on the basis of the WTO mandate, but also on the world's leader, world leaders uh, mandate embedded in, in the SDGs, uh, which have tasked the WTO to deliver on this important uh, goal. Having said that, uh, we're concerned that there are certain flexibilities in the text that could 
uh, become important loopholes um, and that could render the prohibition uh, ineffective. In this respect, we are of the view that flexibility should be kept to, to the minimum and must be accompanied by sustainable commitments and, and conditions. So now I will uh, focus on, on two of those uh, flexibilities and maybe I'll do a couple of other remarks on the text. I will start with, with Article 4. Um, and it's important uh, to reiterate, as, as uh, uh, Sebastian uh, also indicated in his presentation, that with more than one third uh, of assessed global fish stocks being overexploited, a complete and simple prohibition uh, on harmful subsidies applying to all our fish uh, stocks is what is needed um, from the conservation perspective, and there should not be any exemption to this. Um, once an entity uh, has made a determination or a final determination uh, that a fish stock is or fish, any subsidy must be eliminated or withdrawn. Um, uh, as indicated by, by, by uh, Alice, there is an exemption to this prohibition in Article 4.3. Uh, but from the, for the, from the sustainability perspective, members should not be permitted, uh, in our view, to provide harmful subsidies merely by showing that they have uh, measures to recover uh, the stock to the healthy level as it is still overfished. And the provisions of subsidies, we believe increase the risk uh, that the effectiveness of fishery management uh, measures are, will be undermined. This flexibility in our view is too broad, particularly with the inclusion of the word other measures uh, and don't we, uh, ensure uh, the recovery uh, will be effective. And that's um, our main concern. Even the depletion even the deletion, sorry, of the word uh, promote, which was in the previous text, um, the prom promote to rebuilding, uh, which is a step forward, um, we believe is still insufficient. Now, moving to Article 5, um, and I think probably, probably a lot of people share this view that uh, or agree that the prohibitions on overfishing over capacity has the greatest uh, potential for significant impact uh, on the water and also with respect to the livelihoods of the of the communities that that depend on on, on, on fisheries. Um, so therefore, is is a key element uh, to believe to truly deliver on the on the WTO and SDG mandate. Um, now there is a flexibility on the prohibition on article, the prohibition on 5.1, which is we believe is, is a good prohibition in, in terms of addressing the mandate. But there is a flexibility on article 5.1.1 that as currently drafted uh, is, we believe is highly concerning. Uh, it's too broad and undermines the, the objectives of the 14.6 uh, of, uh, of and, the, and, the, and the WTO as it allows members to continue providing uh, capacity enhancing subsidies that risk um, uh, the effectiveness of the, of the again, fishery management measures. Um, the presence of measures intended uh, to, to man uh, at maintaining the levels of stock uh, at a sustainable level is in itself evidence that a fishery faces a reduced threat of depletion. This flexibility should be eliminated or strengthened at the very least. This is particularly concerning, as I mentioned, and, and the text proposes to leave it up to members to, to determine what the biological bio sustainable stock is, which could allow governments to continue to provide um, harmful subsidies, even when stocks are at a very low biomass. This is more concerning now that the distant water fishing or fishing beyond national jurisdiction prohibition has been a uh, moved to article to the list of article 5.1 this is the the old uh prohibition on 5.2 a uh, of the previous uh text um and now that is this prohibition is part of the list of 5.1 it will be subject to the sustainability test and the special and differential treatment 
to, to hold the flexibility. So this is <clears throat> this is a setback <clears throat> in our view in terms of the uh, sustainability perspective. A provision of subsidies to fishing in areas beyond national jurisdiction should not be subject to any flexibilities or exemptions. Fisheries in the high seas cannot be subject to sustainability tests as those carry uh, on in the EECs, since there is no comprehensive governance uh, framework in the high seas that defines what constitutes sustainable fishery practices, nor it has a mechanism to perform environmental impact assessments that could determine the real impact of fisheries in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Now, finally, to, to, to comply with the dual mandate, uh, we support alternatives for special differential treatment uh, that are focused on sustainability requirements and time-bound flexibilities. Uh, and here, we, we agree with, with some of the ideas uh, uh, introduced by, by, by Sebastian, you know, the, the time bound element is, is important. Uh, this will enable developing countries to implement the proposed uh, new disciplines effectively rather than on permanent exclusions and, and carve outs. I would like to refer specifically to the new <clears throat> approach introduced in, in the in Article 5.4, uh, particularly the, the, the minimis exemption using the global marine uh, capture fish, fish production. This approach is welcome, but we believe it should be more limited. While the de minimis exemption um, could provide a flexibility to an important number of developing countries, we strongly encourage uh, to make it time bound. <clears throat> In particular, as it is proposed to, to apply to all types of fishing, um, also important to know that countries that fall, fall, uh, fall below 0.7% uh, of marine capture accounts approximately for 11.4% of the total, which is not insignificant. In this respect, the proposed inclusion of, of the best endeavor uh, sustainability commitment um, in 5.4C is welcome and should remain uh, in the text at the very minimum, in view of the risk of certain subsidies uh, potential to, to lead to our, our efficient over, over capacity. Um, also, if an exemption to the, to, is to be agreed uh, or carve out, uh, they should be conditional to transparency and notification requirements and the demonstration of effective management measures in place to at least limit the risk that subsidies are not contributing to our efficient and our capacity. Now to conclude, um, we under the current circumstances under which you are all negotiating are difficult. There's no deadline. Uh, members have achieved significant progress. Um, there's a risk of reopening issues. Um, however, failure to reach an agreement is not uh, an option. At this point, uh, members must exercise uh, pragmatism to get the job done. We understand that there is, you know, as I said, that there's no deadline for 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 to conclude the negotiations or for the uh, MC12 for the ministerial conference. But if you don't mind, we would like to give you a deadline. Um, we have the UN OSHA conference in Lisbon uh, at the end of at the end of June. Uh, if members um, put a deadline just before. Uh, UN Ocean Conference, WTO members uh, will be able to, to deliver on the SDG 14.6. So with that, I will, I will, I will conclude and happy to, to answer any questions. And also, uh, as uh, Alice mentioned, we're um, available to members uh, to discuss you know, the different recommendations that we put forward. Um, so I will thank you and all eyes are on you. We're, we're still there. We are not going away. Thanks, Ernesto. I identify with the tuna too, I think. But no, the point about deadline is important, but also I think the, the point that you made about just how far members have come, right? Um, and I was reminded of this when I was updating my slides for the umpteenth time, but like uh, this agreement has come a huge distance. Um, and that is all thanks to you, delegates, because you've made all of that possible. So a huge thanks 
and a big round of applause from us. I think there's 10% left to go and it probably will be the most difficult 10%, but it is 10%. Um, thanks. There's a question here that I'll read out and then I might put it perhaps to both to, to Sebastian and Ernesto. Uh, Sebastian and Ernesto, you can see it, it's to the host and panelists, but it says regarding 5.1.1, so that's the management qualification on the main prohibition, do you think it's essential to apply a time limit to it? Would that help? Um, and then secondly, in the current 511, is this aspect essential to address global overfishing? So essentially sort of is there, is there a, perhaps kind of to, to reflate it maybe a little bit simpler, um, is there a rationale, is there, what is the rationale for having 511? Does it help to, you know, it's, you know, it, it plays a role clearly in mitigating the impact of 511, this is sort of the firm part of the prohibition. Um, but is it actually potentially also useful? And is it, well, I'll ask you, the, I'll ask maybe the, the first question to Sebastian, is it useful in moving members towards management as a, as a corollary of being able to provide subsidies? Uh, and then I'll ask Ernesto whether you think it's strong, because you said you don't think it's strong enough. And then the question maybe is, how could it be improved? So Sebastian, is that kind of 511 qualification useful? I think it's, it's kind of almost kind of locked in as part of the agreement, but can you help us to understand the pros and cons of it? Yeah, uh, thank you, Alex. I think uh, uh, this, uh, the hybrid approach, I think as some mm -hmm. people have commented upon, I think is uh, fairly useful, especially uh, to uh, serve as an incentive uh, for, uh, say for example, the fishermen's unions can, can tell the government that, okay, some of the social uh, provisions uh, given to the fishing sector for the workers on board, uh, these can be maintained uh, only if you have a, an effective conservation management regime at work. So therefore, I think uh, in exchange for uh, some of the uh, reasonable uh, kind of support to the fishing sector, I think uh, the workers in the sector can, can uh, tell uh, others that, okay, we are having this conservation management measures in place and only after that we are, trying, we are taking this kind of uh, you know, assistance to workers on board and so I think uh, it, it helps to uh, even unions to uh, demand the governments uh, or the cooperatives to uh, request their governments to uh, have an EEZ Act, for example, you know, for resource management to be taken more seriously. Therefore, yeah. the earlier kind of a, a, a focus on uh, soon after the law of the sea convention in the 1970s, when countries declared the EEZ uh, mm -hmm. from the exploration exploitation, I think. Uh, we, I think is now based on all the uh, information and analysis, uh, we know that it's time to shift gear. So I think shifting gear uh, mm -hmm. at the same time, not to deny some of the legitimate uh, social protection uh, kind of benefits to the workers in the sector. But then that is not something which we give without making sure that the resources are effectively, efficiently uh, protected. So therefore, I think it serves that purpose to to uh, have that safety net around all measures. And if that is taken seriously, mm -hmm. maybe we can see how the uh, specific uh, you know, listed approach of subsidies can be looked uh, case by case basis, perhaps, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, super, that's very helpful. And I'm, I'm gonna come back to you again about a question about applying management to artisanal fishing, but maybe Ernesto on 511, you said it needed to be re removed or at least made more effective. More effective how? Yeah, we we um, as I mentioned, um, Article Five is is uh, probably the 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 most important element. I mean, all the elements are important, but in terms of delivering on the Monday, we believe it will have a greatest great, great, greatest impact. Mm -hmm. uh, however, with this flexibility uh, as it stands, uh, it, it runs the, the the risk that we will not be able to get to that level of of of, of ambition that we are looking for. Uh, and and the reason because it is 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 because the sustainability test on five point one point one relies on on you know obviously the member demonstrating that the resources are at a biological sustainable level, but that means that members have to have some certain level of management that can be able to demonstrate uh, that and and there is proof there's but unfortunately there is no perfect management. The management that is in place mm -hmm. sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work, sometimes is very political, 
Um, so in, in for to have this type of flexibility, we believe that there, there must be language, uh, uh, and we have proposed this in our analysis that includes reference uh, language that to, to ensure that whatever measures do you have are uh, uh, ensuring that those uh, stocks are at a biological sustainable level. Um, so we have, mm -hmm. in fact, it said that, you know, introducing the, the word effectively ensure or going to the footnote uh, uh, where the definition of biological sustainable level, MSY, also add some some reference there to, to, to more precautionary uh, mm -hmm. reference points or, or the MSY should be above the level that is able to produce uh, MSY and not at the level, which uh, I think we, we can have another discussion about mm -hmm. that, but there are elements that can be used to improve uh, the thresholds uh, to be able to to use this flexibility. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as the current stands, and I mean, everything will depend on the implementation at the end of the day, but mm -hmm. if it's too, too lax, then we are yeah, on the right rest that members will just notify, you know, I have a measure, but without demonstrating that the the stocks are are uh, healthy, mm. so I, I hope that answers the the questions or helps. <laughs> no, in fact, that last phrase is probably kind of gets to the gets to the nut of the concern. I think so. That's helpful. And so you'll be circulating your analysis of the text with some of this discussion in it. Okay, good. Um, I think everyone will find that helpful. It's always useful. Um, we, we have only a couple of minutes left. Sebastian, I have one question for you, um, and then another question maybe for Ernesto. Uh, one of the, I think kind of one of the concerns that a lot of members have raised uh, specifically about their artisanal fishing sector is that it can be very difficult to manage it to, in, in terms of kind of resource management, right? That, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom are extremely poor in very isolated communities, and it's difficult to apply fisheries management to these communities. But I think a lot of your comments seem to be going in the direction of saying we need management to be applied in those fisheries. I mean, is it a question of time or flexibility? I mean, how do you how do you respond to the concern that I think some people listening may have to say that's just really hard? Yeah, and Alice, yeah, thank you for that question. And I think uh, our position is that uh, the the age of uh, unconditional access to uh, fishery resource, marine fishery resources is over, and we need to think in terms of a conditional access to marine fishery resources. And and uh, uh, I don't think the number of fishing vessels and number of fishers uh, is that difficult to manage if you have a proper governance mechanism at work. So mm -hmm. therefore. Uh, Conservation management can be undertaken if uh, either by the state or by the uh, co-management type of regimes. Uh, communities are given uh, empowered to look after the resources. The cooperatives can play a new role. They played a role in uh, increasing production in the past. I think now perhaps they can uh, play a greater role in, uh, in conserving management on the one hand, and to move the emphasis from uh, capture fisheries to value chain approach. So I think you need to improve the resources at sea and also uh, the, the kind of uh, revenue that can be generated from uh, each unit of fish which is produced. So therefore the value chain perspective, I think is uh, in fact, it, if you look at all the uh, recent uh, uh, fisheries uh, schemes in India, there is a very strong emphasis on value chain approach. So I think mm -hmm. the value chain approach is a one good way to uh, uh, remove the change emphasis from production to, to value addition. So I think and value addition, conservation management, and effective social protection, these kind of measures, I think uh, uh, using uh, the resources, financial resources more effectively, more wisely uh, in the present circumstances, especially you know, when there is a much greater domestic market access and international market access, I think uh, would be uh, a kind of a, a prudent for the sector. So I think the argument that it is uh, very difficult to manage because the number, I think it, that is something maybe you could have said 30 years ago. Now I think mm -hmm. uh, things are better. Even the number of uh, vessels are reducing. In fact, if you look at the number of fishers and number of vessels, there is a movement uh, away from the large number of vessels to less number of vessels. So therefore, I think it's uh, those kind of, uh, you know, it's more manageable now than before. So therefore, I think that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, if you can manage a large fleet of trucks and, uh, you know, um, uh, there's certainly much less number of fishing vessels at sea. Therefore, it's not really a difficult issue to 
thing in terms of, and it's a matter of political will and uh, and just a matter of changing the mindset of the sector uh, to see that you know it's not a blank check, it's not unconditional access, it has to be a conditional access. Then of course, making sure that uh, the livelihood interests are protected, that a few intergenerational equity issues are taken into account and the sustainable resources are you know in the backdrop of all this kind of uh, community development. Yeah. Mm. No, thank you. That's both a really useful reality check and quite inspiring. So that's the perfect the perfect final intervention from you, from you, Sebastian. There was one last question, if you'll forgive me, people, um, and just leave us a couple of minutes. There was a question in the, um, in the chat about the fuel issue, which is a difficult one. Um, and I thought I'd give it to you, Ernesto. Can you, is there, do you have any ideas on how to strike the balance? Maybe it's in your textual analysis and which I'm asking uh. you for a scoop. Well, it's um, it's a diff it's a difficult issue, obviously, uh, and obviously very political. Um, however, for uh, fuel, as as we have said in the past, and and many have might agree to this, that fuel subsidies is probably the most harmful form of 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 capacity enhancing uh, uh, subsidies. So, so the you know the agreement it needs to. Uh, address address this issue now. The the fact that you know the WTO has a definition or specific non-specific, I think is a, in this case is a a, a legal uh, fiction. But the reality is that non-specific fuel subsidies that are also given to fishery subsidies will have an impact. Um, so that cannot be cannot be ignored and cannot leave uh, unaddressed. Um, also, members have commitments to. Uh, with the objective uh, to transition toward climate neutral economy, so this should be part of their of their policy to to address that that concern. Um, mm. I, and I will just make reference to the fact that um, now that members there's an understanding that the, the, it should be a, a standalone agreement, there is a possibility to move away from that definition. And that has happened. I mean, there are examples like the agriculture agreement at the WTO in terms of subsidies that uh, has a different, the, uh, different standard. So why not to go in that same direction in, with the fishery subsidies agreement? I think the, 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 mm. the, the fact that there is an understanding that it will be a standalone will allow to, 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 to address this, this these uh, non-specific fuel subsidies without undermining the definition on, on the SEM agreement. Um, okay. but, uh, but I'll stop there because I think we're running out of time. I hope I hope that gives at least a light. <laughs> it is no, it's a useful it's a useful kind of additional thought. Um, listen, I know that there's no kind of yeah. All right, no more questions um, in the chat, which is a relief to me because we are a few minutes over time. Thank you very much, everyone, for for staying with us. Um, I hope you found that useful. Uh, it's our first webinar of the new year, and I hope it's given you a refresher on where you are, what the state of play is in the text that you're so carefully working on, um, and a few bits of inspiration about where to next as you look back at these provisions and start to think, how are we going to close them? A um, uh, good point from FS though that we have the UN Ocean Conference coming up, so think about that as a date if it if it helps to focus the mind. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us in such numbers. Thank you very much, Sebastian, and thank you, Ernesto. Uh, both of those presentations and your answers to questions were really, really useful and very insightful, um, and I think gave us a good, a good reality check and a good inspiration for where we might go next. So thank you for your time, both of you. Thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Um, we'll be putting the recording and the slides up on our website, uh, maybe not tomorrow, but Monday, so you'll be able to send them uh, back to colleagues. Thanks for joining us um, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.